The next item of business is a debate on motion 16407 in the name of Ian Gray on student support. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Ian Gray to speak to and move the motion for up to seven minutes, please, Mr Gray. Thank you, presiding officer. I move the motion uh, in my name. Scotland students have been poorly served by 12 years of SNP government. It is true that successive uh, SNP governments have maintained free tuition in our universities, which, let's not forget, was introduced by the Labour-led administration back in 2001, uh, and which, of course, means we are very happy to support the government amendment this evening. It's also true that the SNP government abolished the graduate endowment, a one-off payment on graduation, only paid at all by the better off 50% of graduates. But the endowment did not, of course, pay for tuition, but rather for grants and bursaries for the next cohort of students from low-income families. And sure enough, having ended this payment from better-off graduates, as night follows day in 2013, the SNP government duly slashed grants and bursaries which go to poorer students. £35 million was removed from students' pockets, their grants were cut by 33%, as much as £900 less a year for some. And that would be bad enough. But what makes it worse it was the biggest trick played on students, the dirty, dishonest, dump-the-debt con of 2007. When elected, the SNP certainly didn't tell us that they would cut student grants. In fact, they actually promised to give all students all living support as grants, they'd abolish student loans and even pay off outstanding student debt. Here's what their manifesto said. An SNP government will replace the expensive and discredited student loan system with means-tested student grants. We will remove the burden of debt repayments owed by Scottish domiciled and resident graduates. Instead, 12 years on, they have supersized that student loan system now worth almost £5 billion, and graduates now come out with twice the debt they had when the SNP told that whopper. And by the way, the poorest students, stripped of those grants, without family to lean on, are coming out with the biggest debts of all. And they've even been let down on the smallest of promises, a higher threshold for repayments of loans. Not much help, but some. In England, the threshold is already £25,000. SNP ministers have been promising that for years now, but they just can't get it done. And for FE students, it's worse. A postcode lottery of bursaries varying from college to college, while year after year, colleges were left without the resources to pay those bursaries, having to plead for in-year budget adjustments just to keep their students afloat. Richard Lockhead. I thank Ian Gray for giving way, and if I can just interrupt his doom and gloom for a uh, quick intervention to say, will he at least acknowledge that this SNP government in Scotland and this parliament gives the best support package for students anywhere in the whole of the UK? And secondly, that our graduates leave with less debt by far compared to the less debt, the debt that's inherited by the graduates from elsewhere in the UK? Ian Gray. Well, in terms of living support, that is simply not true, and I'll come to that uh, in a moment. But... What I will acknowledge is that when the government announced an independent review of student support, it really was time, it looked as if they were going to do something to make up for all of this. It was a serious review with a serious chair in Jane and Gadia, and it made some serious recommendations. It promised a new social contract for students, access to a guaranteed income based on the real living wage, and parity for FE and HE students. We on this bench has welcomed it. We wanted it to go further. It, it wasn't perfect. It didn't do nearly enough to rebalance grants and loans for our taste. It had nothing at all for part-time students, but it was a start towards a fairer student support system with, at its heart, equity for all. Above all, it recognized the thing that this government has never really got their heads around. Free tuition might remove one of the barriers to university, but it is not in and of itself enough for many Perhaps more young people, it is their worry about having enough to live on which holds them back. And that's why ministers 
ludicrous 16-month delay in doing anything about the review they themselves commissioned is so inexcusable. It took seven months for the then minister to respond at all last June. She acted on bursaries for care experienced students, great. But for everyone else, it was all so difficult. She was speaking to DWP about how FE support would work with benefits. She promised a review for part-time students by the end of last year. She was talking to the Student Loans Agency about raising the repayment threshold. So here we are, another nine months on, two new HEFE ministers since then, albeit one very briefly, the living wage up twice, a whole new cohort of students now close to finishing their first year of study, and none of these promises have materialized. But, President officer, this is the government that said they could create a new independent nation in 18 months, but they can't even raise the repayment threshold for graduates in that time. The fact is, our students still have less to live on than students in England or Wales, albeit, of course, tuition is not paid for in those jurisdictions, which is why we can't support the Conservative amendment this evening. Our motion only asks the government to implement its own review, a modest demand indeed. But let's be clear, it does demand some urgency. If the motion is carried this evening, we want the minister back here with a plan for reform in the next few weeks, and we want students to benefit in the next academic year, starting in August and September, not some vague time far off in the future. Surely that's not too much to ask. Uh, Mr Gray, I'm not aware of you having actually moved your motion. Did you? I must have missed it. I was so intent on listening to you. <laughs> I now call on Richard Lockhead to speak to and move Amendment 16047.3 for up to five minutes, please. Um, I thank the Labour Party for bringing this motion to Parliament, which gives the government a good opportunity to outline our support, our impressive support for Scotland's students. Our colleges and universities, of course, play a vital role in delivering the skills, the people, the innovation required to support our economy, and our students, of course, are central to that objective. And since 2007, this government has sought to maintain our world-class reputation in tertiary education by investing £7 billion in colleges and in recent years over £1 billion per year in universities, introducing free tuition for our students, something which has not been introduced across other parts of the UK. We've delivered significant and lasting reform across the college sector to drive forward our, our regional approach to skills and education in local authorities. And of course, here we are, as we're debating today, we have begun implementation of a minimum income guarantee for our students, focusing initially on some of society's most vulnerable students by introducing a care experience bursary. We have made a firm commitment to those who want to study at college or university in Scotland that access must be based on the ability to learn and not the ability to pay. We restored free education for first-time undergraduates, which helped more than 120,000 students studying in Scotland each and every year. And those students could face debt of up to £27,000 in tuition fees if studying elsewhere in the UK. So we will not introduce upfront or backdoor tuition fees in this parliament or ever. And across both sectors, further and higher education, we are seeing record levels of student support as we speak. More full-time higher education students than ever are receiving support. A total of 147,920 in 2017-18, up 3.1% from the previous year. Meanwhile, the further education budget this academic year is at the record level of over £111 million in college bursaries, childcare and discretionary funds, a real terms increase of 33% since this government took office. Yeah. Ian Gray. The, the figures are really quite clear. The Young Students Grant is currently £2,000. In 2012, it was £2,640. You've cut what students have got to live on. Richard Lockett. I'm coming to the fact that the bursary offering we have in our colleges and universities is the best you can get anywhere in the UK. <laughs> Rather than rest on our laurels, we did commit... Well, 
An FE student can receive a non-repayable bursary of up to £98.7 per week, and that's the best level anywhere in the UK, including Labour-run Wales. So rather than rest on our laurels, we commissioned an independent review, of course, of student support, as referred to by Ian Gray, to see what more could be done to build a fairer future for all. And I want Scotland's student support system to be focused on the most vulnerable students, complementing this government's wider ambitions to reduce child poverty and widen access to university. So we welcome the report's central premise of creating a student support system around the key values of fairness, parity and clarity. We also support the ambition outlined in the review to achieve a minimum income for our students. And we will indeed be supporting the Labour uh, motion today. It was, after all, this government that first introduced the concept of a minimum income guarantee for higher education students back in 2013-14, meaning at that time that students most in need could access a guaranteed income. Ian Gray. Just to point out to the Minister that the review did not have an ambition of a minimum income guarantee. It had a recommendation. Will he agree to implement it? Richard Lockhead. And of course it's our ambition to implement that guarantee and that's the whole purpose of what we're saying here today. And that's why we are supporting the Labour's motion. You should be welcoming that fact, not opposing the fact that we are supporting your motion. We have, of course, already begun to implement the review's income guarantee by investing over £5 million to increase the care experience bursary to £8,100 per year. And the further education care experience bursary increased from £4,185 to £8,100. And the higher education bursary increased from £7,625 to £8,100 per year. That is excellent progress. And that was a really important step in recognising the needs of this group of students and supporting them to enter uh, either further education or higher education. We're also, uh, as you know, committed to further £21 million per year towards the support, which will be phased in. And in order to support access to bursaries for students from low-income families, we will raise the higher education bursary income threshold from £19,000 to £21,000. We'll also increase bursary support for low-income young students in higher education from £1,875 per year to £2,000, which combined with raising the higher education bursary threshold will benefit 13,500 students in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And further to that, we'll increase bursary support for the most need independent students in higher education from £875 per year to £1,000, which will benefit nearly 18,000 students in Scotland. So these combined improvements will result in around 31,000 higher education students benefiting, benefiting from an improved package uh, of support. And for further students in further education, just to come to a conclusion, we'll increase bursary support so that in 2019-20, students can receive a bursary of up to £4,500 per year, which will benefit over 7,000 students. That is a number of examples of how this government is delivering unprecedented support to Scotland students, especially those in most need, those in our disadvantaged communities. And we should be proud of that record that this parliament and this SNP government has delivered. Minister, I'm pretty sure this time that the amendment wasn't moved. And I'm delighted to move the amendment to <laughs> my name. Thank you. Uh, I now call on Liz Smith to speak to you and move amendment 16407.1 for up to four minutes, please. And Deputy Presiding Officer, may I move that amendment, yes. please? Uh, That's I, how to do it. <laughs> can I thank uh, Labour very much for bringing this debate to Parliament for two reasons. Firstly, because the availability of student support is just as important a factor in students' decision about whether to attend uh, college and university as any other factor. Uh, and while uh, we don't agree entirely with the Labour position on some of this, I do think uh, Mr Gray has been asking very pertinent questions of the SNP government about uh, ambitions for the policy. But the second reason that I'm actually very pleased we're having this debate is because of the very fast-changing nature of the context in which we should be debating further and higher education generally, whether that's the increasing number of students who wish to access further and higher education, the widening access agenda, the increase in articulation, and overall funding structures, including student support, all of which are hugely important to the future success and sustainability of both sectors. And of course, shortly, we will be able to see uh, the results of the international comparative studies, which will set out the challenges that Scotland faces in this respect. Notwithstanding that, I think we can all agree that many of the recommendations as sent out, set out in the independent review, including the principle of the minimum income level and the concept that there should be more parity involved across the board when it comes to different categories of students, whether they are at college uh, or university, is very welcome. 
Uh, Part-time students and students with disabilities, for example, have often felt very left out of this debate. And that's a major concern if we're trying to make uh, to take on uh, some of the suggestions that we've had from these quarters, because it's very important that we ensure that our workforce is much more flexible in order to adapt to the changing needs of the economy. And that was something that was strongly highlighted by Su Susan Stewart at the Open University and by Alistair Sim in University Scotland. So these aspirations are extremely welcome. With that context in mind, however, I think there is a bigger picture here and we need to examine that. And it's something which Professor Ian Diamond was very clear about when he called for reform in Wales, when the central proposal was to look at the student package on an overall basis, not just about identifying uh, the funding of living costs on an issue as, uh, as on its own. And I agree with that to a large extent. I think Ian's, uh, approach, sorry, Ian's approach to this, uh, and there are some very other, uh, other very interesting examples around the world, New Zealand being one, where the policy is set in that similar context uh, of overall support, rather than the rigid policy divide of dealing with student support, uh, separation from the paying for tuition. Now, it's very important to say that the Scottish Conservatives have always believed that the Scottish system must be distinct. That is not in any way appropriate for uh, us to implant uh, another system on top of Scotland just because uh, we have seen some success elsewhere. But I do think that we should be examining the policy proposals much more closely in, in other countries and the respective costs. And just because the issue is complex um, and there isn't one system in the UK that has got things right, and I do think some of the claims by the uh, Minister uh, this afternoon um, are really uh, from a different planet when it comes to uh, bursary support, um, I think we have to look at um, the whole perspective here. Because given the experience elsewhere, there is surely a very strong case for the reform of student loans, something that was highlighted in uh, the independent report and by several other reports into the funding uh, of tertiary education. And I think uh, we would do well to pay a lot of um, concern to what uh, Lucy Hunter Blackburn has been saying about the, um, the balance which I think Ian Gray mentioned this to uh, grants are now so low that those from the lowest incomes um, will be taking on some of the highest uh, debt. That's a major concern. Uh, before I finish, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I just uh, deal with the SNP uh, amendment? Because whatever they like to say, university education in Scotland is not wholly based on the ability uh, to learn rather than on the ability to pay. And there are hundreds of very well qualified Scottish domicile pupils who are in schools just now being squeezed out of the university system and they will tell you exactly that. The SNP knows that jolly well that the current system is both discriminatory and financially unviable in the longer run. And they also know that the upfront backdoor fee situation that they describe in their amendment is not the position of the Scottish Conservatives. Colin Ross Greer for up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to Ian Gray and the Labour Party for bringing this motion to the Chamber. We seem to go through phases in debating education policy. In the last Parliament, further and, our, uh, further and higher education was very much the focus. But since 2016, that focus has moved to our schools and to early years, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but even at that, there's been remarkably little chamber time given to the important issues in education that we're talking about since the last election. So it's to Labour's credit that they've put the issue of student support back on the table today. The ethos that underpins Scotland's education system for centuries now is one of universalism. That education is and should be for everyone. We came to that conclusion long before many others, though it's taken us a long time to even come close to making it a reality. And there's still some way to go. Whether someone decides to go to college or university in Scotland, they should do so in the knowledge that the financial support they need will be there. But we know that's not the reality for far too many. Free tuition, which enjoys broad support in this chamber, only goes so far, as has already been pointed out. To make Scottish education genuinely accessible, we need to get a grip on living costs for students and what's driving them up, not just on the support package we can put in place, but what is driving up those costs in the first place. Right now, there is a clear inequality in our further and higher education system. Students from wealthy backgrounds just don't need to take on paid work to cover their living costs. So obviously, many do to supplement them. That means they can devote greater time, if they choose, to their, uh, to their studies. They can put in the hours that they need to do well. Students who don't come from privileged backgrounds and who do not have the financial support of their family, for example, face a tougher time. For too many, part or even full time work is taken on not to supplement their income, it's a necessity without which they just can't cover the costs of staying in education. 
And that in turn squeezes out the time they would otherwise commit to making the most of their course and of the wider experience of being at college or university. And it's not just the time spent at work. Students are more likely to be doing bar work, working in shops and supermarkets or cycle couriers. This is hard and often deeply exploitative low wage work. When you're exhausted at the end of a long bar shift or after hours of cycling across the city, going to the library for a few more hours of studying that you really need just isn't realistic. And loans for living costs are available. That may cover living costs at the time, though I know from friends right now that it's certainly not doing so for many. And it does mean taking on debt, which takes years to pay off. The future earnings of these students, the future take-home pay, will be lower because of those loan repayments than someone who was lucky enough to have wealthy parents, for example, who could fund their education. This just isn't fair, and I think we all agree on that. We may have different solutions, but I think we all agree on many of the principles here, though you wouldn't notice that from some of the opening exchanges today. The burden of debt and the financial costs associated with higher education also acts as a barrier for those from low-income backgrounds. We know that. We may we may not have gone down the route in England where students are charged extortionate fees of over nine grand and where maintenance grants have been axed, but we can't be complacent. And the disparity between student support at university and at college is an acute inequality acknowledged by the student support review. The review could not even use a clear and concise figure for student support at colleges because no national set entitlement exists. But your cost of living isn't cheaper if you're at college rather than at university. Here in Scotland, where colleges play a greater role in delivering higher education, we really need to ensure that students are entitled to similar levels of support. Ensuring that students have proper maintenance grants which afford them a decent standard of living is an important goal, but it's only one part of the solution. We need to get to grips with the cost of living for everyone. Increases in private rent and the cost of public transport in particular are putting intense pressure on students. We need public ownership of housing and transportation to ensure that these are available as a public good. Making public transport fare free, a green policy that's uh, partially addressed by Labour's other motion today, would remove a major barrier to education for some students. And a minimum student income and tuition for university alongside policies like this are what we need to deliver inclusive college and university education. So the Greens are more than happy to support both the Labour motion and the government amendment today. I think we all agree on much more of this than we're being letting on so far. I call Tavish Scott for up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I thank Ian Gray and the Labour Party for bringing forward this motion today, which we will support, and also uh, the Government Amendment. I had two observations on the uh, Minister's remarks in, in, uh, in opening. He talked about student support. I, I, it'd be important when Ministers are talking in this area about support that they mention loans and the balance between loans and bursaries, because that's the argument that, uh, uh, that will be rehearsed undoubtedly in this debate this afternoon. But the balance between that has undoubtedly changed and become more difficult uh, for uh, students of all backgrounds, but particularly, uh, as Mr Gray rightly said in his opening remarks, from those from uh, the most poor, from the most deprived uh, backgrounds. And that is of some significant concern. I'm sure it's, it's of concern to the government, but I think they would need to recognise that in, in, in how they address this debate today. And the second point is that um, Richard Lockhart very helpfully clarified that the government would support this uh, uh, motion from the Labour Party, which means it'll win today. That means, as Ian Gray rightly said, I think the government have an onus when they're winding up this debate today to say when this, this uh, will indeed now happen. If they can't give a timetable today, then uh, I suspect Parliament and more to the point student bodies would be very grateful if they could set that out at some stage uh, in the coming weeks so that uh, uh, student bodies and multiple, uh, students and parents could understand whether a new arrangement will be in place for the start of the new academic year uh, in August uh, and September. Uh, I have a number of observations to make uh, about the, uh, the balance between bursaries and loans that others have already uh, highlighted uh, because for me they, they, this is at the core uh, of, this, uh, of this issue, that the poorest students continue to take on the highest loans in Scotland at £5,780 per year for the lowest income household income bracket compared to £4,940 for the highest. And for a student on a four-year uh, standard Scottish degree, that's £23,120 23, uh, of uh, debt. Bursary spending in 2008-09 uh, was £105 million. Uh, today, it is now £76.3 million, a decrease of 27%. And the consequences for that uh, are very uh, clear. The value of loans uh, was £187 uh, million pounds in 2008-09. Now it's £528 million, pounds, an increase of 183%. Or well, for the average student uh, who took out 2400 
120 pounds in 089, it is now 5,290 pounds. So I think it is reasonable uh, to ask the government to reflect, as indeed uh, the purpose of this review uh, set out why that balance has changed and when uh, the word support is used it would be more accurate to say uh, th that uh, loans or rather debt has uh, greatly increased uh, for Scottish uh, students over the last uh, 12 years on the government's own figures. These are not uh, figures that uh, any of us have come up with. They simply reflect uh, the government's uh, own uh, figures. Uh, the review itself uh, is important. It's an important contribution, not least of which for the point that uh, Ian Gray and Liz Smith have rightly made about the distinction between uh, higher education uh, and uh, uh, other uh, vocational uh, uh, education and training uh, and seeking to find uh, a better way to deal with that. We have talked uh, for many a year about parity of esteem. Well, here is a review that actually provides some concrete examples of how uh, to deal with that. Uh, but what it, this uh, absolutely is, is about the government finding a way to tackle that increase in student, student borrowing, uh, to do it in a uh, constructive manner and to recognise also that recommendation 19 of the Commission on Widening Access, uh, the part that said uh, that there was a need to look at the balance between loan and bursary impacts upon access, retention and choice of institution uh, has not yet been addressed. This review has, the, the, the government sorry, has not yet addressed that and the review hasn't either. I hope those matters will be taken uh, forward and the government have a chance in winding up this short debate this afternoon to tackle all these issues and set out exactly when this is going to happen. Thank you very much, Mr Scott. Open debate, speeches of a type four minutes. Jackie Bailey, followed by Claire Adamson. Ms Bailey, please. So it is a matter of regret that I think students in further and higher education have been let down by the SNP with the lack of financial support um, provided whilst at college or university. Free tuition is one part of the equation, but living costs are very much the other. And despite pledges by the SNP to scrap student debt completely in 2007, the debt is skyrocketing. Student debt is up by 169%. Their day-to-day -day cost of living and the lack of financial support from the government is seeing the poorest students being forced to take on multiple low-wage part-time jobs, which does have a negative impact on their grades and their well-being. Let me acknowledge that free tuition opened doors to students who had previously thought that they could not afford to attend university. But for many, loans instead of bursaries are simply unsustainable and storing up huge debt for the future. The reduction of the young students' bursary in 2013 meant that the SNP claim of supporting the poorest students in Scotland didn't just sound rather hollow, it was downright dishonest. And whilst I do appreciate that it may be raised for 2019, it is well short of the 2013 level. You can't expect to be congratulated for putting a little back after the lot that you took away in the first place. But let me, let me try and be fair and acknowledge the helpful steps taken by the Scottish Government. Firstly, commissioning an independent review of student support was the right thing to do. Secondly, committing to increasing the bursary for care experienced young people was the right thing to do. Thirdly, raising the threshold at which repayment of loans starts is the right thing to do, although I confess, presiding officer, I find it hard to believe that the UK Government is moving quicker than the Scottish Government on this. But you know what is so disappointing is that there has been little progress on the other recommendations, like the real living wage for students, parity between further and higher education, and no real understanding in the Minister's response about the need to do something pretty urgently. We need practical implementation, not some kind of vague ambition that simply kicks the can down the road. A minimum student income, based on the recommendations of the independent review, would help over 170,000 students in further and higher education to be in a much better financial situation than the one they're in currently. Getting decent financial help will undeniably have a positive knock-on effect on their well-being and their attainment. Now, not all students have the bank of mum and dad to fall back on at the end of each month. Students are as diverse as the subjects they study. Some are carers, some are parents, some have disabilities, some are even mature students. All of them, all of them need a minimum student income. Without it, many students would not start further or higher education in the first place, and many of them, too many of them, end up dropping out because they can't afford to remain. Finally, presiding officer, I want to raise briefly a constituency issue. 
the young people of our armed forces families living in Scotland are experiencing very real struggles due to the complex nature of their parents' careers. Let me give you a very specific example. This a has young to be, girl sorry, this has to be brief. It is, presiding officer. A young person from Helensburgh has been told that she is unable to receive a tuition fee waiver for a college course because her parents haven't bought a home here yet. Her father is a Navy officer transferring to Her Majesty's Naval Base Clyde. She is living locally, but he is currently in a submarine, submerged underwater, will be for the next six months without any contact at all with his family. Communication in these circumstances is impossible and there is no flexibility or help given to this young person. So I would ask either the minister or the cabinet secretary to intervene. Presiding officer, let me finish by saying I regard education as a key driver for our economic success, but we need to provide sufficient support for students to live to enable that economic success to happen. And it's time the Scottish Government stepped up to the plate for Scotland's students. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, but we really have tight time in these short debates. That's how it's set out by the Bureau and by the parties leading the debate. It's tough, but it's the way it is. Claire Adamson followed by Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I had been um, quite looking forward to the debate this afternoon, which I thought would be um, an interesting and informative one. Um, I'm somewhat disappointed by um, the tone of the opening from the Labour Party um, with Scotland's students being poorly served. I mean, we have um, 120,000 students a year studying in Scotland, benefiting from free education. And we have more students um, attending in our colleges and universities. And to say that we're letting them down, I, I feel is just um, painting the worst possible picture here. But I do I have listened to the pleas from the Labour Party about what they, they want the government to do, what they say the government should, should do. I have sympathy with a lot of what they are saying. So why didn't they bring this forward at the budget? It was only a few weeks ago. They could have made this there. Yeah. Yes, I'll take that intervention. Ian Gray. We, we have repeatedly in previous budget proposals included uh, improvements to student support to no avail. Perhaps we should blame the Greens for not putting that in their budget debate, their budget deal. Or, here's a good idea, let's blame the government who are in charge of the budget. Claire Adamson. It's simply... I, I, I can't believe we're arguing and making comments about manifestos from 2007 as if the financial crisis had never happened. And this from the party of backdoor tuition fees. Now, I, I welcome the contributions from some of the other colleagues around, around the chamber today who have approached this in a, a kind of positive way and, and looked to it. And I, what I was wanting to talk about today was the um, parity of esteem. And I looked back at um, some of the work that was done around the contract of a student summary recommendations. And at the time, the government had commissioned the IPPR to do some research on support for students. And it involved seven international um, comparisons and um, was a study that went into great detail about it. And it said that um, there's some more general discussions of the relationship between financial aid and student participation and retention experiences. One of the things this report highlighted was there was a very different approach in the UK in particular towards higher education and the vocational post post um, uh, education training or VET areas and uh, the d data um, draws out some commonalities but um, most countries do not separate that in, in the way that we seem to have done in the UK leading to that disparity of esteem that we talk about so much. So I, sp I spent last week at Motherwell College speaking to some of the CITTB um, joinery apprenticeships there and seeing um, some of the great work that they were doing in the college there and um, I remember that very fondly because I used to watch my father and my brother go out to university together both in student grants at that time and understand absolutely what it means for people from poorer backgrounds to be able to access higher and further education 
But it is a complex situation. And one of the things that the IPPR also pointed out, that the complexity is around the fact that we don't have control over housing. We don't have control over social security and the full level of benefits that could be done. And that makes this a more complex situation in trying to do the right thing by our students. And the members you know, de definitely the in their last minute. Already, sorry. But I, I think it's really important that, that, that we do recognise that this um, had we more powers here to deal with these issues, mm -hmm. such as social security, then we would be in a better position to support some of our students in a less complex, more simple case, which is also what the IPPR and the recommendations are looking for. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And I call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Mr. Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, as Ian Gray fairly pointed out at the start of this debate, it's not really possible to have a discussion in this Parliament on the issue of student support without thinking back to the 2007 Scottish Parliament election. That was the election when famously the SNP stood on a platform to dump the debt. They promised every student and every graduate in Scotland that their student debt would be written off. Now, needless to say, that never happened. In fact, after 12 years of the SNP in government, Far from student debt having been dumped, it has in fact doubled in that time. So I think we have to take anything that the SNP say on this issue with a serious pinch of salt. In her comments earlier, uh, Liz Smith drew comparison with the situation uh, in Scotland uh, and that south of the border. And while I think that we in this parliament need all, not always be looking at what happens down south, nevertheless, there are sometimes useful comparisons to be drawn. Despite all the rhetoric we hear about free education in Scotland. It is simply not the case that the fee regime that exists in England and Wales, not one that we support, but the fee regime that exists there, there is no evidence that this has deterred those from less well-off backgrounds from accessing higher education. Indeed, the admission rate for those from disadvantaged backgrounds to universities in England has for a long time been substantially higher than it is in Scotland. And the reason for this is very simple, presiding officer, because those from the poorest backgrounds do not pay tuition fees, either upfront or deferred. Moreover, they have in the past been able to access much more generous bursary support, uh, bursary support, which is of course funded from free income to the higher education sector. So we need to end once and for all this nonsense uh, claims that having fees or a graduate contribution will in itself deter those from poorer backgrounds from going to university because the evidence will tell us something different. And I'll, I'll give way, but I hope the Minister would accept that point. There is no evidence of that central claim. Minister. So, just thank you for giving way to Murdo Fraser. Can I take it from his comments that his policy remains scrapping free higher education and reintroducing tuition fees? Mr Fraser. I, I, know, I know the Minister did, did not admit that basic point. He should look at the evidence. He, he will know perfectly well. In, 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 the past, in the past, we have set out plans for a modest graduate contribution. We'll set out in manifestos for coming elections exactly what our policy is at that particular time. But he needs to accept the reality that having a graduate contribution does not deter people from the poorest backgrounds from going to university because that is precisely what the evidence tells us. And we have the backing for this, of course, from the Scottish Government former civil servant Lucy Hunter Blackburn, who confirmed uh, that uh, free tuition alongside a cut in grants delivered by the SNP has helped middle class families and students while poorer students are worse off as a result. And this is what she said and it's a direct quote. Free tuition in Scotland is the perfect middle class feel good policy. It is superficially universal but in fact it benefits the better off most and is funded by pushing the poorest students further and further into debt. That is a damning verdict on the SNP's government as record in this area. And yet, of course, what we are now seeing are growing concerns from middle-class parents across Scotland about access to university here. The cap on places for Scottish students, again, a direct result of the so-called free education policy, means there are many talented pupils not able to get into the university of their choice in Scotland. And we see this, for example, the consequence of this in our health service, where we are turning away far too many talented young Scots who want to study medicine here and cannot get a place when our NHS desperately needs their skills. Presiding officer, Liz Smith has set out the principles that should apply to student support, endorsing the recommendations in the recent independent review, including the principle of a minimum uh, income level. I agree uh, with uh, that approach, and we need to be informed by the work that's ongoing, and I'm pleased to support the amendment in her name. Thank you very much.
called Kezia Dugdale, to follow by Alistair Allen. Ms Dugdale, please. Thank you, President Officer. I've got a long-standing interest in the topic of student support, so I really welcome the opportunity to contribute to the debate this afternoon. My first job was as a welfare advisor in a students' association, and I remember very vividly dealing with hugely distressed students trying to prove their independent status. One in particular who's had a really negative experience of coming out, had been disowned by their parents and couldn't prove that they were now self-funding and battling with the Students' Awards Agency at the time to make sure they could get the bursary support that they needed. We also operated the university's uh, crisis fund, its discretionary grant scheme, uh, on behalf of the university and were daily making decisions between applications for crisis funds, between uh, people that needed support to pay for childcare versus people who were on the uh, verge of being evicted from their flats, really desperate stuff. And I think that student poverty is still very prevalent, if not even worse today. I left that job in 2006 to go and work for the National Union of Students and alongside student officers I helped draft the uh, NUS Scotland manifesto for the 2007 election so it's with that background that I come to the chamber today to say I really welcome the idea of a minimum student income guarantee put forward by the independent review but it's not a new idea it was in fact proposed by NUS Scotland back in 2006 and I went through my uh, old emails today and I found this document. I've got a habit of keeping uh, copious notes, presiding officer, something which should worry quite a few people. But I found a, I found a grid, I, I found a grid uh, of the 2007 party political manifestos and, uh, and it notes uh, what each political party said in response to NUS Scotland's call for a guaranteed minimum income. And interestingly enough, there's a reference in almost every single political party's manifesto to the idea of a guaranteed minimum income. It was on page 28 of the Tories. The Greens were the only party to fully endorse it. That was on page 9. 34 of Labour, 28 of the Liberal Democrats. The one political party that had no reference to it was, of course, the SNP, because they were going to promise to abolish student loan debt altogether. What an embarrassing situation we find ourselves in today. The idea behind a minimum income guarantee was that it would take on the costs of rent, the costs of food and avoid a situation where poorer students have to take on part-time jobs in order to get by. Back in 2006, we were arguing for it to be £7,000. It's not increased to a huge amount uh, over that period of time. What I would say to Claire Adamson is that she bemoaned the idea that she didn't have particular powers over the welfare system to do the things that she would like to do. The SNP have had full power and control over student support for 12 years. And if she wanted there to be parity between FE and HE, she would have done something in the last 12 years to guarantee an income for FE students. And separately, for Richard Lockhead to come here and say he's got the best package of student support in the UK, when we look at a Tory government that are the most right-wing dysfunctional government I've seen in my lifetime, it's hardly a badge of pride that he should carry. And before we get denunciations of what's happening in Labour Wales, can I say to the government, the poorest students in Wales get six thousand pounds worth of bursary. That is three times what the SNP offer the poorest students here in Scotland and it's high time they did something about that. So I'm fed up of hearing calls from SNP members about parity of steam between FE and HE. They've done little if anything to address that and there are far more imaginative ideas they could turn their minds to like how to help people who want to get off benefits into college transition. It is almost impossible to move from housing benefit into FE because you have to forgo six weeks of benefits and then wait for your student support. They have the power to introduce new benefits now which could help people move off of benefits and make a life for themselves and their families. Their heads are down. They know they can do better than this. They know their record is tatters. It's high time they admitted it. Thank you very much. I call Alistair Allen to roll by Jamie Halker Johnson. Mr. Allen, please. Presiding officer, there is an ever greater recognition that we need to offer a broader range of choices and pathways, uh, if either higher or further education, or genuinely to provide opportunities to all of Scotland's young people uh, in future. We have a lot of work to do before we get to that position of equality, but it is important that we recognise what is being done now in our colleges and universities already. As other speakers have already indicated, not only are more Scots uh, than ever winning a place at university, but it's also important to say that more Scots than ever from our most deprived communities are going there too. Now, clearly, there is more than one factor at play uh, in overcoming educational inequalities. The need for more contextual admission policies is certainly one, but many of the factors determining those inequalities in further and higher education 
and of course the same factors that impact on inequality and poverty more generally, the UK government's benefits reforms being but one that comes to mind. But the independent review of student support recognised these problems among students, both in further and in higher education. And the Scottish Government has responded by improving support for both groups in the course of the last year. Indeed, the Scottish Government paid out more in grants and bursaries last year, uh, uh, which was up by 8.9% uh, on the year before. But nobody in Scotland is shying away from the reality of student poverty. Neither does the independent review, referring as it does to examples of some students who felt compelled to live off credit cards or payday loans at some times of the year. Now, I've said something about what the Scottish Government is doing in response to difficulties like that. But I also want to say that some of the things the Scottish Government is not doing represent an equally important contribution to solving the problem. Presiding officer, I know and we've heard it here today that some members don't like hearing about how Scottish policy differs from that in the rest of the UK. Sometimes perhaps because they find the very idea of difference offensive or sometimes because it's just information they don't want to hear. But Scotland's decision not to follow the UK's precedent in some areas of higher and further education policy has been a very conscious one with its own financial implications, but I believe with its own benefits too. So I make no apology for referring to one of the biggest policy differences of any kind now between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and that is, of course, university tuition. Uh, it is free in Scotland as opposed to a 9,000 a year fee or up to a 9,000 a pound a year fee uh, in many universities now in England. Now, there is a reason, presiding officer, why the average student loan, in Scot average student loan debt uh, in Scotland is significantly lower than it is in any other part of the United Kingdom. In England, the average debt is £32,000. In Scotland, it is £11,700. We've also made clear, uh, and it's important, I think, uh, to mention this too, that uh, in Scotland, we have no intention of following another UK government decision, and that is the decision to abolish maintenance grants for new students. The Scottish uh, government has also sent out a very important signal by confirming that eligible students from other EU countries on courses beginning in the year 2019-20 in Scotland will continue to be supported for the duration of their courses. Further evidence that despite the endless uncertainty of where the UK is headed this week or next on Brexit, Scotland is determined to show that we understand the huge benefit to our country that students from around uh, Europe represent. So, presiding officer, as this report makes clear, we have much to do, but much is being done in Scotland for students in both further and higher education. And the mistaken UK education policies that we are not following in Scotland is something we should never let slip from our minds. Thank you very much. Jamie Halker-Johnson, followed by Rona McLean. Mr Halker-Johnson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I echo the uh, points made by many previous speakers uh, that student support is a vital area for discussion? And so I welcome today's debate being brought forward. Far too often, the issue of student support has been drowned out in the noise created discussing tuition costs. And while tuition costs matter, as others have mentioned, they've not always been represented uh, in the most accurate way. However, there are real and genuine concerns over student support and the cost of living at university and college. For many students in my region of the Highlands and Islands, particularly, going to university means moving away from home, often to, for, by a long distance. The independent review is a good start to tackling these problems, and the principle of a minimum income level is a welcome suggestion that could provide additional clarity and certainty to prospective students. In terms of the proposals around parity between further and higher education, these mirror the issues around parity of esteem between differing destinations. If we're to support the parity of esteem, then there must be also be greater fairness in our approach. Those students who choose a different route should not find their choices narrowed or their conditions reduced. There was broad support for these principles in the independent review's consultation, and it is important that the Scottish Government responds effectively to those findings. Going to university in Scotland remains a costly business, but the average debt level is not the only element. Today, young people from low-income backgrounds are the most likely recipients of larger student loans. We should be mindful of that and its future impact on social mobility, because the issue of repayment is one that arises within the review but it's one that seems to have received little attention in this chamber. The annual repayment threshold for a student loan in Scotland inched above 18,000 for the first time this year. For the Plan 2 student loans available to students south of the border, that repayment threshold is already 25,000. 
while an announcement was made last year to match this level by 2021-22. The obvious point is that low earning graduates with student loans continue to find themselves paying more in Scotland, or even paying back when students from other parts of the UK would not have to. This was recognised as an issue in the SNP's own 2016 manifesto, which had previously pledged a threshold increase to 22,000, which is still some distance away. In the meantime, are we supposed to believe that this position can somehow be seen as fairer to students and graduates in Scotland? Significant disparities between the two student loan types have been long-standing, at least Scottish graduates with a considerably worse deal, often at the very start of their careers. And just as importantly, leaves low-earning low graduates more out of pocket. Deputy Presiding Officer, these examples are emblematic of the lack of attention that has been paid to student support. For too many years, a real focus on student funding and the round has been sacrificed for a narrow glance at tuition costs. The independent review has been a credible attempt to address these issues, but it has resulted in the same lack of clarity and the same delays from the Scottish Government that have burdened discussions around student support in the past. While I welcome the warm words from the SNP in regard to its recommendations, I cannot forget the cynical promises made by their party when over 12 years ago they narrowly won an election on the back of a pledge to wipe out student debt in its entirety. Instead, we saw not only a doubling of average debt, but Scottish graduates left worse off through the repayment system. Again and again, that burden has fallen on those least able to pay. So less SNP rhetoric and more reform is essential, reform that must be brought forward at pace. Thank you very much. I call Rona Mackay, last speaker in the open debate. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Th uh, this is a, an important debate Labour have brought to the Chamber today. And at the outset, can I say there's nothing in the Labour motion that in principle I disagree with. Uh, students must have sufficient income to live on. The fact is, however, that the Scottish Government has already committed to more investment in student support than the review immediately called for. 21 million, which goes further than the 16 million that was recommended in the review. Student funding is at the core of our higher education system and the SNP government remains committed to providing all students, especially those in our most deprived communities, the financial support they need to succeed. Our commitment not to charge university tuition fees is one of the most precious policies this government has introduced and I'm extremely proud of this. It's not just one thing, it is a huge factor in widening access to education. This year and next, we're investing £16 million to expand uh, access to further hi higher education bursaries for students from the lowest income families, and we'll raise the higher education bursary income threshold from 19 to 21,000. In addition, bursary support will be lifted from £1,875 per year to 2000 Bursary provision rose by 8.9 to £76.3 million uh, last year. Currently, a full-time 19-year-old Further education student in Scotland can receive a bursary of up to £4,247 per year, the best level anywhere in the UK. In comparison, a full-time 19-year-old further education student in England can receive up to £1,200 per year, up to £1,500 in Wales and up to £2,092 in Northern Ireland. And crucially, at a time when we want to encourage more young people to study in Scotland, the Scottish Government has confirmed it will support eligible EU students commencing courses in academic year 2019 to 20. Presiding officer, the number of students... Uh, yes. Ian Gray. I acknowledge that the figure of £4,100 for an FE student is half what the independent review said they should have access to. Rona Mackay. Well, I think the Minister explained that we are working towards building on that. Um, and it, you know, it's, well, it, it's part of the, of the review that we're looking at. Um, and I, think, I don't think you can discount the fact that we do not pay tuition fees. Um, and it is, it is still the best level in the UK. And crucially, a time when we want to encourage more people uh, the government has confirmed it will support eligible EU students commencing courses in academic year. The number of Scots entering universities are record high, as is the number of students attending university from the most deprived areas. And we have no intention of following the UK government who abolished maintenance grants for new students in England from academic year 16 to 17. 
It's also worth emphasising that the average student loan debt in Scotland is significantly lower than it is in part of the United Kingdom. In England, the average, in England, the average student debt is 32 to 20. In Scotland, it's 11,740, a huge difference. However, we can't be complacent and there's still work to do. Uh, Jane Ann Gadia, who led the independent review called uh, A New Social Contract for Students, Fairness, Parity and Clarity, said in the review's report, the Scottish Government focus on funding tuition fees for social and economic prosperity is to be commended. To build on this report, we established the Commission on Widening Access and are leading an evidence-based programme for implementation. We're determined that young people of all backgrounds should have access to higher and further education. So in conclusion, presiding officer, the Scottish Government regard education and student wellbeing as a top priority. And I believe our record in supporting students demonstrates that beyond doubt. Thank you very much. Closing speech of Colin Oliver Mandel to close the Conservatives. Mr Mandel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to close today's debate for the Scottish Conservatives and I would like to start by thanking the Labour Party for bringing forward uh, this debate to Parliament um, and would once again impress upon the government uh, the importance of maybe making some time uh, themselves uh, to debate education issues uh, here in this chamber. Um, I also think Ian Gray uh, is, is right as well to highlight the fact that students here in Scotland have been poorly served overall uh, by the SNP. And this is once again an issue where the government's rhetoric doesn't match up with the reality of people living the length and breadth of this country. And I think we saw that uh, from the decision by uh, various SNP uh, backbenchers to, to dodge uh, once again some of the difficult questions. And I wonder uh, how uh, Dr. Allen can uh, recognise uh, student poverty um, but the, uh, not recognise the fact that it's taken uh, his party and this government 12 years uh, and an independent review uh, to get to the point of having an ambition uh, to do something about it. I think that's disappointing and I don't think it serves any of us well. I do, however, think the debate has uh, brought these issues out into the open mm -hmm. um, and ensured that we start uh, considering the report's recommendations in the round. It's also um, very important that we do agree uh, that the availability of student support is just, import, just as an important factor for students about their decision to, decide, or decision to attend college or university as any other factor. If people don't have enough money to meet their immediate living costs, uh, the idea that they're going to go to uh, university is just unrealistic. Um, it's also um, imperative uh, that uh, we make sure that uh, support is there for people going to college as well, not just university. I know, um, as someone representing a rural area, uh, that people do have to travel quite far afield uh, sometimes to access the college courses they want. And I think uh, Ross Greer is right here, uh, that there is much more uh, that we agree on in principle uh, than, than, than that separates, uh, in fact, at least in ambition terms, uh, all, of, all of the parties. Um, and I think we must also acknowledge as a starting point, uh, that the current system is far from adequate and in many respects is failing some of the students who depend upon it the most. Mm -hmm. What we need is new thinking and an honest debate about higher education funding policies rather than simply pretending that all is going well. And I think Tavish Scott is right too uh, to highlight the balance uh, between loans and bursaries. That is an important distinction for people. Um, and uh, to pretend otherwise, again, I think is, is disingenuous. Some of the decisions that do need to be taken are complicated, uh, but I think we also have to uh, recognise the fact that some of the other recommendations outlined by the independent review are much simpler and quicker to fix, including improving clarity for students and ensuring that they and their parents fully understand the financial support that is available and getting some of those messages out there uh, of, of, of the improvements to support uh, in, in certain areas that we've seen since the review uh, came in. But more importantly for me, I think uh, we should all be concerned by the comments from Lucy Hunter Blackburn, um, an Edinburgh University researcher and former Scottish Government civil servant, uh, because the idea that, as, as she stated, that this review is heavier on presentation and analysis and ducks uh, issues uh, of part-time maintenance support um, and also, uh, to quote again, feels like a review uh, whose impact on higher education at least was always intended to be strictly limited uh, should give us cause for concern because by failing to properly consider all of the options and pushing difficult issues to one side doesn't help students and doesn't support the sustainability of the university sector. 
it is yet another example of the SNP government's pick and mix approach to policy development, not just in this area, but right across government. And I will conclude uh, there, uh, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Richard Lockhead close to the government. Please, Mr Lockhead. I very much uh, welcome this debate and value the contributions made from all parties across the chamber. And I should start by saying that we should not underestimate the challenges facing Scotland's students in today's Scotland. And I have regular meetings with NUS Scotland, as well as students in all our campuses across the country. And I'm very well aware, as I'm sure we all are, of the day-to-day -day pressures they do face with their finances and their living standards. And of course, NUS Scotland are working with the Scottish Government, and it's their initiative, are looking at the cost of the student day and all the issues around their living costs. And we've agreed to work with NUS Scotland to take forward some of these issues in due course once the surveys and the research has been carried out. So there are very, very real issues facing Scotland students and young people today. And of course, issues facing all of Scotland's families, given we've had 10 years of Conservative Party austerity, we face the impact of Brexit on our economy, and we shouldn't fool ourselves, these issues are going to impact on Scotland's further and higher education sectors and, of course, on the living standards of students as, as well. So there are very, very important issues that have been raised in the Chamber today, briefly. Neil Finlay. Just a point of fact and clarification before he moves on. Can he confirm that for the lowest income students, the Scottish Government does not offer the best support package in the UK? Minister. Well, I am going to come on to the support again, which I mentioned in my opening remarks, that we do give for Scotland students, which I do believe which I do believe is the best package in the whole of the UK. And I will address that in a couple of seconds. But, you know, we have heard quite a lot of hyperbole, particularly from the Labour Party benches and misleading comments and, you know, right-wing measures from the Conservative Party, as we'd expect. Now, for instance, both Myrtle Fraser and Liz Smith seem to suggest that free higher education in Scotland chases away Scottish students from Scottish institutions. The most recent UCAS figures show the number of Scots winning a place at university is at a record high. Second point, Scottish domiciled full-time first degree university entrants have risen 16% from just over 25,000 in 2006 2007, when this government came to power, the SNP government, to just under 30,000 in 2017 2018. A 16% under this SNP government, briefly. Uh, I, I thank the Minister for that. There is some truth in exactly what he said. But the, mo but, but the, most, important, the most important aspect, Minister, just now, is that as a result of so called free higher education, far too many domiciled Scots are not getting access to the place. Minister. We're at a record high and I'm going to come back to that point in a second or two if time allows because I've taken two interventions. In terms of the hyperbole and outrageous claims we've had from some of the members and some of the benches, it's been overall a good debate with valuable points made. I have to pick up on Jackie Bailey who said that free education, free higher education is a small part of the equation. Well, I would argue that in terms of support for Scotland students and knocking down the barriers to higher education and widening access to education, it's a pretty monumental part of the equation. Yeah, yeah. And we should not lose sight of that. In terms of the debt that students inherit when they leave university, yes, we'd love to do more. We'd like to do more. And if the budgets were, uh, you know, more affluent, then we'd be able to do a lot more. And we didn't have a £2 billion real terms cut from the UK government. I'm sure there's much more we could do for Scotland students. But let's look at the facts, as many members have mentioned, in terms of debt inherited by graduates in Scotland. In, in England, the figure is £34,800. In Wales, it's £21,520. In Northern Ireland, it's £22,440. In Scotland, it is £13,230. So you leave with a lot less debt if you attend a Scottish institution than any other part of the UK. And we've also heard claims that somehow free higher education and the, the student support package in Scotland is deterring people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Well, of course, we've got a lot more to do to attract students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Ross Greer is quite right to Minister, say this is a major sit down issue a minute. we have to it, it, a minute, please. It's too noisy. I want to hear what you're saying. If you want to say something, do an intervention or in the summing up. Minister, Thank you, short debate, I do officer. want to hear And I'm everybody. sure Scotland students really want to hear what we're seeing as well, given the, the importance of this issue to them uh, as well. But in terms of widening access to higher education, it's now the situation where 15.6% of Scottish full-time degree entrants to Scottish universities were from the 20% most deprived areas in 2017-18. We're making very, very significant progress. That's a very highly significant statistic, is about people having the opportunity to go to university 
university who may otherwise not have done before. And I want to commend our colleges uh, who are involved in a lot of higher education these days and of course our university sector for everything they're doing to widening access. And indeed the Commissioner for Fair Access said the latest figures vindicate the Scottish policy of free higher education. So these are very, very important issues. And I just want to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, by saying that in Scotland, you have some of the most generous bursaries in the whole of the UK. You have free higher education. You have the best terms and conditions for even our loans in Scotland. Therefore, you have the best package for Scotland students. There's a lot more to do, but the SNP government is certainly delivering for Scotland students. Thank you. <laughs> Mr Finlay. The minister took two interventions and I commented. I gave him his time back on that for it. Don't you say anything about how long is he getting to me. I'm in charge of the debate. I'm sorry. This is not a discussion. No, 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 no. I don't want to hear from you. Unless it's a point of order. Unless it's a point of order. Right, let me hear your point of order. President officer, I was directing my comments at you with respect. Well, thank you. So I, I, I take that as an apology for me mishearing it. Uh, oh, no, I don't expect an apology from you, Mr. Mr. I beg your pardon. It was looking at me when you said it. And I'm not going to have that to the chair conducting the debate. When a member takes interventions, whoever it is, I try to compensate. Now, that's wasted even more time. Ms. Fee, would you sum up, please, for Labour? Thank you, um, Presiding Officer. Student financial support is in need of urgent reform. No one in this chamber can disagree with that statement. And many speakers across the chamber this afternoon have expressed concern at the lack of progress on this issue. Scottish Labour welcomed the independent review of student support. Our motion today highlighted the need for a minimum student income tied to the Scottish Government's living wage, as recommended by the independent review. And what we need now is the Scottish Government to urgently bring forward plans to implement this. After all, presiding officer, this proposal comes from their own initiated review. And as Ian Gray pointed out in his opening remarks, this was a review that on these benches we welcomed in 2017, and we continue to support it today. And our motion, as moved by Ian Gray, demands urgency. If the motion is carried this evening, we want the ministers back here with a plan for reform in the next few weeks. We want students to benefit in the next academic year, not some vague time in the future. And by supporting Labour's motion tonight, we are sending a clear message that we take seriously that commitment. And, presiding officer, the government, despite indicating support for our motion, and being given every opportunity today to give a time scale to come back to this chamber with a plan. They, if, if he's going to tell me a time scale, I'm happy to take the intervention. Minister. Thank you for taking the intervention. I just want to reassure the member, as I said before, that the government is supporting the Labour Party motion today, and I do undertake as minister to keep Parliament informed in early course of our journey towards the minimum income guarantee. Ms. Fee. With respect, um, presiding officer, early course is not good enough. We require urgency and we require a plan for this to be done. <laughs> Balancing education and debt is not a situation we want our young people to face. And, presiding officer, instead of dumping the debt for students as promised in 2007, the SNP and government have delivered devastating cuts to student support that has seen debt soar by 169%. Scottish Labour would reform student support, beginning by implementing a new social contract for students, which includes a minimum student income that is recommended once again in the student support review. It was Scottish Labour who asked tuition fees in Scotland. This supported thousands to study on their ability to learn not on their ability to pay. Our new social contract would benefit over 170,000 students. The social contract would include a minimum student income linked to the real living wage, giving students a guaranteed income to study. Instead of delivering their promise to dump the debt, the Scottish Government have driven student debt up by forcing more young people to rely on loans by cutting the young student bursary. 
The bursary available to students today remains lower than it was before the SNP cut it by almost £900 in 2013. The new proposal on the student bursary would indeed raise it. However, it would still be less than the pre-2013 figure. And this dis disproportionately affects our poorest students. It was this government who commissioned the independent review of student support. And it was the SNP who has ignored its recommendations and has watered down its support for the review. And we do welcome the government's commitment to raising the repayment threshold. But what we need to do now is build consensus to deliver. We must develop equity and parity between the higher education and the further education sector. And for too long, students have had a raw deal. And it's only right that we take steps now to remedy this. And, presiding officer, we know the situation south of the border that's resulted in students facing a £9,000 debt for each year of university. We do not support a return of tuition fees in Scotland, especially for the poorest. A new social contract tied to the real living wage provides what students need. And whilst many will continue to work, a real living wage in the workplace of £10 an hour, as pledged by Labour, will continue to support students throughout their time studying. And the NUS briefing for today's debate highlighted their reservations of the introduction of loans in the further education sector. And they have reiterated their view that improvements to student support should be delivered through increased bursaries rather than through loans. There should be less focus on promotion of loans and more focus on tackling student debt. Cuts to bursaries have caused higher debt and that is not sustainable. No one in this chamber wants to see our young people saddled with debt dropping out of university and education settings. We need real, tangible support for our young people to allow them to achieve their potential. And that is why I urge everyone in the chamber to support our motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee. That concludes the debate on student support. It's time to move on to the next item of business. I'll give a few moments for the front bench to change places.